LinkedIn presents. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. I'm handing over the reins this week to my producer, Caleb, who's going to share with you a special conversation. It's about ambition, adventure, politics, and what it takes to make a dent in the world. Here's Caleb to tell you more. I want to introduce you to the most interesting person you've probably never heard of. His name is Rory Stewart, and here are just a few highlights from his dramatic resume. He went to Oxford and then to work as a diplomat, and some said spy, in Indonesia and Montenegro. He walked across Afghanistan alone just a few months after 9-11. And he wrote a book about the adventure that the New York Times called a flat-out masterpiece. He served as the deputy governor of two Iraqi provinces, and later was tapped by King Charles to set up a nonprofit in Afghanistan that helped rebuild the old city of Kabul. After that, he was given a chair at Harvard and invited to prepare strategy for President Obama. He did all of this before the tender age of 35, an age, he tells me, he never thought he'd reach, which may explain what he did next. In 2009, he decided to give up his comfortable Ivy League life and run for British Parliament in the largest and most sparsely populated constituency in England. Surprisingly, he ran as a conservative, a party he'd never voted for. Unsurprisingly, at least to me, he won. Rory spent the next decade in office, and his journey through the corridors of power is the subject of his new book, How Not to Be a Politician. The title gives you a pretty good sense of what kind of memoir this is. Rory is a wry critic of his own shortcomings. He's also unflinchingly honest about the damage a job in politics inflicted on his brain, body, and soul. But the book is also a riveting firsthand account of the seismic shift that occurred in politics over the last decade. A shift that Rory not only watched with horror, but also tried his best to stop. Rory Stewart entered Parliament as a liberal-minded centrist. Ten years later, after mounting an unsuccessful campaign for prime minister, he was kicked out of the party by the man who beat him, a man Rory refers to as an insubstantial clown, Boris Johnson. The center ground that Rory spent his career defending was now scorched earth. Compromise, nuance, and pragmatism were out shallow populism was in. So I wanted to talk with Rory about how all of that happened. Not just the ideological stuff, but how the game of politics got so cynical and glib. And what, if anything, can be done to change course. Our friend Adam Grant picked How Not to Be a Politician as one of his favorite books of the year, praising it for giving readers, quote, a view of what's wrong with politics and how we can make it right. So how can we make it right? Adam and I aren't the only ones interested in the answer. Rory co-hosts one of the UK's most popular podcasts. It's downloaded millions of times a month. A live taping recently sold out a concert venue in London faster than the Foo Fighters. So clearly, people want to know what Rory Stewart thinks about politics. But there's something else I wanted to talk with him about. Something that's been on my mind as I wind down one year and prepare for the next. How do you make a difference in the world? I think finding a satisfying answer to that question has been the central preoccupation of Rory's life. And he's looked for the answer in many different fields, as an adventurer, as a writer, as an academic, as a politician, and now as a leader of nonprofits. He's senior advisor to an organization called Give Directly, that's given out more than $700 million in cash directly to people living in poverty. 
Suffice it to say, he's knocked on a lot of doors trying to find an answer to that question. How do you make a difference in the world? I wanted to know what answers has he found? Because look, my resume is far less impressive than Rory's, but I still hope to be someone who contributes. Maybe you feel the same way. And if you do, maybe this conversation will give you and me both ideas for how we can make meaning in the world. Rory Stewart, welcome to The Next Big Idea. Thank you for having me. I want to start by comparing your mood, your mindset on on two moments in history. So the first is a morning in May 2010. You've woken up in London in a bed in your aunt's basement. You've put on your smartest suit. You march into the Palace of Westminster, which is where Parliament is located. Why is that moment significant? And and what's your state of mind that morning? So uh, you're taking me back to the moment when I've just been elected as a member of parliament for the first time. And I was then in my late 30s. And I'd spent most of my life in different forms of public service, I guess. I'd been briefly, very briefly, an infantry officer. I'd then been a diplomat in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'd run a charity in Afghanistan. And I guess I'd felt that a lot of my life had been circling around politics, that it was the politicians that had sent us to Iraq and Afghanistan that so many of the things that I was trying to deal with as a civil servant or even as a soldier started in politics. And now it was my chance to get in there and start shaping the future of the country. So I was going in in a a slightly idealistic mindset, thinking this Mm. is really the the way that I'm going to change the world. Okay. So that's May 2010. Let's jump ahead roughly a decade to July 24th, 2019. What's your mindset then about nine years later? Had the idealism completely evaporated? (laughs) So nine years later, you're catching me just after I've run to be prime minister. So I started as a member of parliament. I ended up in the British cabinet. I then tried to fight against a hard Brexit and run against Boris Johnson, stop him becoming prime minister, and I failed. So you're taking the day when Johnson is finally elected as prime minister I resigned from the cabinet because I went to serve in his cabinet. And it was a time of real distraught despair. I felt that everything that I had dreamt about in politics, all the ambitions, all the dreams that I'd had, had collapsed almost in, in one instant. Because very fundamental to the way that I saw my country was that a populist like Boris Johnson would never become prime minister. I mean, I think I I had friends probably in the US who felt the same about Donald Trump. I mean, it's a shattering experience. If you have really convinced yourself that this is a terrible human being who'd make a terrible prime minister, and you fought very hard to stop it, when they actually win, it it wrecks a lot of things, not just your own sense of self-confidence in terms of running against him, but also your sense of what is this country? What is this country that voted for him? What is this country that I've been trying to serve for 45 years, how could they possibly think this is a sensible person? Well, we're going to talk a lot about what happened in that decade and and the rise of Boris Johnson, the rise of conservative populism. But you alluded to this earlier, this decision to sort of come off the sidelines and and get into politics. And I want to to step through that a little bit because it's it's fascinating. You recently told an interviewer that, that as a young man, you prepared yourself to, quote, do something completely astonishing, something that people would talk about for hundreds of years afterward. I can see you almost grimacing and having that youthful ambition was quoted back to you. Where did that ambition come from? Well, I I think firstly, you're right, I'm grimacing because it it is embarrassing to be reminded of what one feels when one's a, a child or when one's in one's teens. And I think it must have come from probably three things. One of them is the books that I read. I I was a very literal-minded child. Mm. I would literally watch Indiana Jones or James Bond movies and think, I can be that. (laughs) And I remember re-watching an Indiana Jones movie when I was in my late 20s and realizing that the guy had just jumped off the top of a submarine and then 
swum for about 10 miles <laughs> through the ocean, I suddenly thought for the first time, I thought, wait a second, maybe that's not actually possible. Maybe I've organized my whole life around something that is actually a cartoon. I think the second thing is I had a very sort of strange type of self-confidence. I was a very cheerful little kid. I wasn't a very soulful kid. I didn't really have proper teenage years. I wasn't particularly depressed or introverted. I was a sort of happy-go-lucky kid who did well at school. And I guess I sort of thought that um, the world might be like that. And I think the final thing is I was also a very strangely idealistic kid. I wasn't hmm. interested in making money. A lot of people who were at university with me wanted to be bankers or management consultants. I, I literally couldn't understand it. I, I didn't even understand why somebody would want to do that. I remember thinking when I was 11, I was watching my friends at school. They were watching a soap opera called Neighbours, an Australian soap opera that was on for half an hour every, every afternoon, every day. And I added up all the half hours that would be in my life. And I worked out that they would be spending about a year and a half or two years of their lives just watching Neighbours. And I was completely sort of disgusted and horrified by this. I really wanted to make every half hour in my life really count. That's interesting because the other thing I get a sense of looking at your biography, reading your biography, is that you're both ambitious and, and you're restless. I think that comes through in the neighbor's anecdote, right? That you seem to be in a race from Eton to time in the army to Oxford. You spoke about being idealistic, but did you feel you had something to prove and you had to prove it fast? Yes, I thought I would be dead in my early 30s. I mean, all the people that I admired had achieved what mattered to them by the time they were in their mid-30s. I loved sort of romantic poets, kind of Byron, Shelley. I adored Alexander the Great. I enjoyed Lawrence of Arabia. All these people were things who had their major achievements in their, by their late 20s. And in a sense, they are products of a sort of adolescent psychological worldview, if you want to be pretentious about it, that they're not fully mature adults. Mm. And so I was driven by those kinds of fantasies of changing the world in the way that somebody in their 20s thinks about changing the world, not the way that somebody in their maybe 40s thinks about changing the world. You almost did die in your 30s because so, so you, you finish school, you're in the, the Foreign Service, in the Diplomatic Corps, you're in Montenegro, and then I think you're offered a post in Bosnia. You turn it down and you decide to take this 18-month solo walk across Asia, and most notably you walk across Afghanistan shortly after 9-11. This was a beautiful but a, a daring journey. Was it trying to live up to your idols? But where, did that, where did that come from? Um. Well, so I'm in my late 20s. As you say, I'd been a British diplomat. And I was very conscious that the life of a diplomat is a life in embassies in capital cities behind high walls. Mm. And I felt that the real world was taking place in rural areas. In Afghanistan, 90% of the population lived outside cities. So for me, this walk was an opportunity to try to connect much more intimately with a more real world. I mean, it was many other things too. It was an adventure. I was probably mm -hmm. trying to impress girls. There was, you know, the many, many different things going on. Sure. But I think the thing that was most worthwhile about it at the end, and the thing that changed the next 10 years of my life, was I saw the incredible gap between the way that the United States, Britain, and its allies were talking about Afghanistan mm -hmm. and what was actually going on on the ground, what I'd actually seen staying in those houses. I stayed in 550 village houses on my walk wow. across Asia. So night after night, I'm sleeping on people's floors usually, and I am hearing them talk about the government and their life, and then I'm walking 25, 30 miles a day from village to village. And so crossing Afghanistan, I had seen opium drugs on their way to market. I'd been shot at. I'd been in communities where women had never been more than two hours walk from their village in their life. And then I turn up back in the capital city and I'm sitting with the president of Afghanistan and all these UN officials and diplomats. And they're saying, every Afghan is committed to a gender sensitive, multi-ethnic, centralized state based on democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And I remember thinking, I literally cannot translate that into into diary. I don't know how I would actually explain that to any of my hosts. And 
that then became incredibly important for me because in a way I suddenly saw all of the 90s and the 2000s in a totally different way. I suddenly thought, everybody's gone mad. Mm. The fact that people that I admired, like President Obama, were sort of endorsing a surge in Afghanistan, that all these generals who I got to know because I returned to Afghanistan, ran a nonprofit there, were embarked on something insane. Mm. I mean, for the first time, it was like um, I suddenly saw the world in the way that you might you know, catch 22 sees the Second World War. It, everything suddenly seemed surreal to me. Strange, surreal, and just the staggering overconfidence. And the, and the, the, the abstraction, too. I mean, yes. you're talking to me from California, which is another part of this story, isn't it? It's a world which believes that everything can be measured. Political mm -hmm. science can research 45 previous insurgencies and come up with a formula and exactly mm -hmm. how many soldiers you need for every civilian, that somehow technology and markets are going to change the world. And then you find yourself in a place like Afghanistan, which is deeply, deeply resistant to all of that, which we still haven't fully processed. I mean, you know, we, we talk about cyber and AI and the US defense budget, you know, running into hundreds of billions. And we spent the US and its allies $3.5 trillion, mm. you know, $3.5 thousand billion dollars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the fact is that in the end, we were driven out by the Taliban who are riding around on ponies and carrying Kalashnikovs and have none of that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you bring the dollars and cents into it because that's actually part of the story, part of your story too, that like, so you do this amazing walk, you then become a deputy governor in Iraq shortly after the invasion, and you're given these vacuum-packed, I mean, it's like a mob movie, these vacuum-packed <laughs> bundles of a million dollars. You're like 30. It's amazing. It is like a mob movie, yeah. You could just do whatever you wanted to, you could disperse it basically with, without any... Yeah. yeah. I'd, I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, it, it, it literally, outside a movie, people would get off the helicopter or the plane, the little airbase, drive over and hand me a black hold all, which I'd open, and the thing was still vacuum packed in million dollar bricks. You then, a few years later, are in Afghanistan running a charity where you basically have one employee and some wheelbarrows and some shovels, so no longer have vacuum packed million dollar bricks. And yet I'm interested for you to compare and contrast those experiences because one gets the sense reading your book that in some ways the sort of roll up your sleeves work you did with this NGO felt to you like it was more efficacious, more connected to what people of Afghanistan actually wanted and needed compared to the work you'd done in Iraq, which was bureaucratized and, you know, fiscally yeah. irresponsible yeah. even. Yeah. So I, I think that's right. I think one of the things that I believe strongly, but is quite difficult to explain to somebody, is that running a small nonprofit in a city block in Afghanistan, working with a few Afghan and international friends and colleagues, I felt I was having much more influence on the world than I felt I was in Iraq, or even when later I was the UK Secretary of State for International Development with a budget mm. of nearly $20 billion a year. That's a lot of vacuum-packed bricks of cash. It's a lot of vacuum-packed bricks. That's a lot of, lot of vacuum-packed bricks. So I, I guess the question is, why is it that I felt more fulfilled, and actually paradoxically as though I had more power, mm. with a budget which was, you know, one hundred thousandth of the size of what I had later in life? And it's something to do with being connected to real people, to a particular community that you can see and touch, buildings that are actually going up in front of your eyes, digging a sewage line, as it were, getting your hands dirty, having friendships and relationships that persist over time, mm. having a small group of people you can work with. These things are very, very difficult to quantify. But in my life, I've been very lucky to have the other extreme, to have the job with the $20 billion budget and the thousands mm -hmm. of civil servants. But I actually feel sorry for people with those jobs. I feel that mm. they're condemned to be free-floating bullshitters. They're so far from any connection with the ground. Yeah, and surrounded by sycophants and surrounded by other people who have no connection to the ground. And All right, so so we're building to this moment though where you decide to where you decide to jump into the political arena. You've been in Iraq, you've been in Afghanistan. By by 2009, you're a professor at Harvard at the Kennedy School. 
you're writing books, you're giving lectures, you're personally advising Hillary Clinton, you're helping to write proposals for, for President Obama. It, it sounds like a, a, a pretty good gig. I mean, you're, you have the ability to be in the room with influential people, you're affiliated with an esteemed institution, and yet you decide you want to run for, for parliament. Why? Like, why at that moment did you feel like, nope, this still isn't, this still isn't quite the dream? Well, I guess at the heart of it is the sense that as a professor and as a sort of advisor, you're not really making the decisions. Mm. And I put a lot of energy into trying to convince people in the US administration that what we were doing in Afghanistan wasn't going to work. Anyway, I, I, I was defeated. I didn't manage to get those views through. And I guess I felt that if I really want to change these kinds of things, I need to go to the heart of things. I need to become an elected politician and make these decisions myself. You also had to have known that it's a brutal life being a politician. The hours are relentless. The pay is terrible. The media is just always waiting to be able to stick a fork in your eye. Did you think that you could grin and bear that? It was worth it? Did you think somehow your experience would be different, that it didn't matter if you were able to affect the kind of meaningful change that you wanted to, that you could endure the sort of the indignities of, of, of being a politician? I mean, I, that's a little, I'm being a little bit overdramatic, but I am curious. Like, it is such an important and yet such a thankless, thankless yeah. career. Yeah, I think if you, like me, go into politics and you are reasonably idealistic, you have to be a little bit naive. Mm. I mean, I think if I had fully understood what it's like to be a politician, I probably wouldn't have been attracted to it in the way that I was. Mm. I thought that, look, I heard all those stories. Everybody would say, of course, it's a horrible business, a dirty business. But I would think, well, maybe it doesn't need to be. Maybe mm -hmm. I can be different. Maybe it's only a dirty business because they're not doing it right. And I think there was a real degree of kind of vanity and self-deception there. Hmm. I think there was a bit of that going on. And I felt that I had skills which were relevant. You know, if, if you're somebody who likes running things, who likes government, who's interested in policy and who makes speeches, then maybe obviously where you should be is politics. But I didn't really realize what politics was. And did you also feel like ideologically you represented something that was useful in the state of things. And by that, I mean, you're a centrist, you're a li sort of liberal centrist, right? And that in some ways you were very aligned with labor's policies on, say, poverty or immigration. And yet you ran for parliament and joined parliament as a member of the conservative party. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your, your ideological stance and sort of how you thought that was, clearly you thought that was something important that you were bringing to the table as well, a, a particular yeah. worldview, a particular ideological view. Thank you. Yep. So you're right. I, I'm. I'm got a lot in common with Labour on many of the social justice issues, but my big break with Labour is that I believe in radical decentralisation, and the tradition of the British Labour Party, which comes out of the socialist movement, is heavily centralised. It's about central planning. It's about clever economists sitting in the capital city, micromanaging the economy. I also believe in institutions and the, the, the value of institutions as slow, traditional buildings up of wisdom. And I felt that I had a particular story, which was a conservative story, which was about love of country, respect for tradition, prudence at home, restraint abroad, now, I, it took me some time to realize that that's only part of me. And I guess that's true of all of us. We're, we're funny mixtures because my wife points out that, yes, there's that side of me, which is I, I talk a kind of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it game. But I'm also, in ways that I probably didn't realize 15 years ago, more radical than that. Hmm. I tend to get very impatient with things that aren't working. I tend to want to work out how to challenge the status quo and change things. What a shock it must have been for you to have that radical undercurrent, that desire to shake things up, to then arrive in parliament and be told on your first day, I think, your job is not really to legislate. 
Your job is not really to have opinions for yourself. Your job is not to vote your conscience. Your job is to toe the party line at all times and support the prime minister unconditionally. And if you fail to do that, you have really no future. You will never advance. Did you think in that moment, like, oh, shit, what have I got <laughs> myself into? No, it was bizarre. It was completely bizarre. I mean, it's, it's not just that. It's also the strangeness. I mean, in m most other jobs, you turn up and there is a, a few weeks of sort of induction and mm -hmm. getting a sense of the organization. And I thought, you know, you turn up in politics and people would talk about moral values. They'd talk about what it means to be a legislator try to talk about ideals and how we're trying to change the country. But politics had none of that. And I guess that's true in the US too. You turn up as a congressman, you turn up as a senator. You're a kind of self-employed entrepreneur who is part of a party system, but there isn't really much attempt to define what this job is, mm -hmm. what you're supposed to be doing. You just sort of make it up as you go along. And then, as you say, you've got this pressure, which is all about you will shut up, you will vote with a party line, and there is huge pressure on you if you don't. And, and you can see this, actually, even in the US, in the way that people talk about Bernie Sanders. You know, people say, oh, a guy rebels too much, he's never done any useful legislation, he's not a team player, or when they criticize AOC, or when they criticize Joe Manchin on the other side. I mean, you, you get a sense of the You've got to be a team player. You've got to stick with, the, stick with the tribe, stick with the party. And you have to serve many masters, too, because you have to be a team player. You also have to be a good steward for your constituents. You have to, I mean, certainly in the U.S., constantly be in the cycle of raising money and planning for your next campaign. I mean, the number of balls one has to keep in the air at all times is, frankly, unrealistic. It's completely unrealistic. And, and Mitt Romney, who came to Harvard when I was there just before I got into Parliament. And he said to me, Rory, I hope you're doing all your thinking now because you're not going to be able to do any thinking uh, when you're in politics. Hmm. And, you know, I, I had friends, a friend who's a congresswoman who said she spent 130,000 hours in two years making fundraising calls. And the, the corruption of that, not in the way that we think formally about big C corruption, but... There's, there's a smaller type of corruption, which is mm. you cannot spend all your time asking money from people without them expecting something in return. And it's terrible. You know, you can make the big pompous statement about how it affects policy, but I think there's a more immediate point, which is about just the personal damage to your character. You just become, mm. over time, a less thoughtful less honest, less courageous person. You become a, an exhausted, slightly shriveled, autopilot version of yourself. You write in the book, I began to feel that the longer I stayed in politics, the stupider and less honorable I was becoming. I want to zoom in on that word stupider. How was being in office making you dumber? How was it watering down your brain? So th this, I think, is very fundamental. So obviously, be being smart is about critical thinking. And critical thinking is about complexity. It's about humility. It's about being able to spot when you're wrong. It's about being able to take in ideas from outside. And politics is the polar opposite. Politics is about campaigning. And campaigning and winning elections is about simplicity, not complexity. It's about confidence, not humility. It's about presenting yourself as always having the right ideas. And the result is that if you spend your whole time out on the stump, parroting your lines, the cortex of your brain begins to be reorganized. You can see it in any politician who's been a politician for more than 10 years. The first sign of it is they lose the ability to actually genuinely listen. Mm because they're pretending to listen to everybody all the time. They've actually lost the capacity to really listen. And it's actually because they're exhausted and stressed. Mm. Think about anybody listening. If you're exhausted, you're stressed, you've got a lot on your mind, you've got a horrible job that you hate, and then you have to sit down, I don't know, at some family Thanksgiving and listen hard to some slightly boring cousin telling you about their life. You just don't feel you have the bandwidth for it. But politicians are like that, unfortunately, when they're having to process what do we do with our COVID response? 
what are we going to do with the Middle East peace process? How should we be responding to Putin coming into Crimea? And their incentives are all wrong. I mean, they're not even thinking honestly because President Biden is not able to only ask him the question, self the question, what is the best thing that should be happening in Israel, Gaza at the moment? He also is thinking, how's this going to play in the press? What's this mm -hmm. going to mean to voters in Michigan? What's this going to mean for my funding cycle? How does this you know, sit with whatever weaknesses a focus group has found, et cetera? So all of that, I think, is what I mean by saying it makes you stupider. Mm. And you're just hemmed in. I mean, you can never admit being wrong. You can never admit being unsure. You have to project confidence and yet warmth, and you have to be brilliant but approachable. I mean, you have to be a study in, in contrast in a way that doesn't I, I, it's just too hard to hold all those conflicting values in one's mind at the same time. Absolutely. And if you're a senator, you have to be pretending that you're in Wyoming all the time and also pretending you're in Washington all the time and also probably pretending you're mastering global events and traveling around sorting out the Middle East peace process. So it's, I mean, th there's a sense in which the whole job is about feeding the completely unrealistic expectations of the public. So I, I was made a foreign office minister. I was made the minister for Africa. And my career had really been in the Middle East and Asia. Right. So I, I was a kind of foreign affairs specialist, but I didn't know anything about Africa. I spoke three Asian languages. I'd spent all this time in, mm -hmm. uh, in Asia. And suddenly within a week, I'm having to stand up and make speeches where I am holding forth on the solution to the civil war in Cameroon, what influence the ex-president of Tanzania should have in Burundi, what position Kenya should be taking on a Chinese-funded rail line, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm talking about 35 different countries, most of which I have never visited. And at some point, somebody needs to be able to say to the public, look, I can tell you what it says in my speaking notes about Cameroon, but the truth is, I've never been to Cameroon. But that isn't what you do. You produce some pompous line. You know, if you're talking about Burundi, you mm -hmm. say, I call on all parties to respect the Arusha Accords and engage with the former Tanzanian Prime Minister, etc. But the words you're speaking, you don't even understand. I don't know what the Arusha Accords are. I'm not even sure where Arusha is. For listeners who are wondering, Arusha is a city in Tanzania not far from the Kenyan border. I had no idea. Anyway, coming up, Rory tells me the story of the last conversation he had with his father. We also discuss why centrism seems to have disappeared from politics. And I ask him, Rory, would you have been a good prime minister? His answer, when we come back. There's a moment in the book where you've been, you've been in parliament for a few years, I believe, at this point. Your father is 93. He's unwell. You go to see him in Scotland, and you talk with him about, about the work that you're doing. I wonder if you, could, if you could sort of recreate that scene for listeners. Well, thank you. So my father was 50 when I was born. He fought in the Second World War. At D-Day, I believe, right? D-Day, exactly. Somebody I adored, but he was a frail man. And he was a frail man by then, in his early 90s, with a very strong view of the world. And his fundamental view of the world was that politics was a complete waste of time and that there was no real benefit in being in what he called a talking shop. So he's very frail, and I'm sitting at his bedside, and I'm worried about him because he's been losing a lot of blood and he's looking very frail. So I start reading to him and he says, darling, I, I, please stop reading. I, I want to know how things are going at, at work. And I say, well, daddy, you know, um, I'm now the environment minister and I'm, I really like those people who run the national parks. And I think mm. maybe they are things to get excited about in Britain because they're such kind of wonderful people. And he squeezes my hand and he says, um, I'm, I'm glad, darling, that you, you feel that you're enjoying your job. But he says it with a certain amount, I think, of, of doubt. And he's very sleepy, so I, I leave him to sleep. And then 
About, I guess, ten minutes later, my sister, who's past the room, shouts to me in the garden. And I run in to find him struggling, and he's having a heart attack. Mm. And I try to do mouth-to-mouth resuscitation on him, and I fail. And so he dies, dies in my arms. Clearly, the loss of, of one's of one's parent stays with, with you, but to have your last conversation effectively be you trying maybe a little too hard to convince him that this is meaningful work, I've, I'm on the right path, and knowing that he, out of love and, and, and pride for you, was, was agreeing, but deep down had his doubts, it seems, about whether you really were doing the most meaningful thing you could be doing. I mean, that, that's, a, that's, that's a lot to carry with you. Yes, it is. And I think, I think one of the things about growing up is I sort of imagined probably that my father had the answer to what one should be doing with one's life. And I think mm. I learned that he didn't really, and he wouldn't have pretended to. He, he doubted <laughs> that being a politician was that. But if I'd really pinned him down and said, okay, daddy, what is the most worthwhile thing I can do with my life? I'm not sure that he would have set himself up as a kind of guru Mm. with the solution. And that's been important for me because I think when I was younger, if you go back to the first questions you asked me about why I became a politician and all this kind of stuff, it was because I'd sort of convinced myself that this was the peak of what you could do as a human being. Hmm. For me, leaving politics has been trying to recognize that we don't live in a world where there's only one thing you can do with your life. I still feel that slightly. I still feel guilty. People stop me in the street and say, you should go back into politics. You should become prime minister. Hmm. But I'm having to sort of come to terms with the fact that there isn't, it's not a moral obligation. We're not all forced to be prime minister. Do you know the other thing that happened on your journey and in your time in politics is you lost your idealism. You saw the level of, of dysfunction. But you also were in politics at a time where the party of which you were a member radically shifted. You were a liberal centrist, right? And there was a place for someone like that in the party at that time in, in 2009, 2010. It certainly doesn't seem like there's much place for that ideological space left in the party anymore. I mean, I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how the ground shifted under your feet while you were in the Conservative Party. I mean, watching – and th- this is this is true not just of the UK, but m- absolutely of the US. And frankly, of we've seen this lurch to the right in basically every democracy across the world over the past decade. You happen to just have a front row seat as it, as it was transpiring uh, in Westminster. I wonder if you could talk about – watching that happen and, and, and what you were thinking, what you were feeling, how you were understanding that, that shift. I saw a party which was a sort of coalition. I mean, there were right-wing elements to it, but there were also a lot of people like me on the left. It was a party which was conservative members of parliament were majority in favor of the European Union. And when I entered parliament in 2010, people who believed in exiting the European Union, Brexit, were a minority. Mm -hmm. And we were a government that was committed to increasing our international development spend, nearly doubling it, to trying to bring in net zero legislation. We introduced gay marriage. And I thought we had a vision of a sort of liberal, compassionate conservatism, which was about the center ground. And we were fighting elections in the center ground. Mm -hmm. But something was shifting in politics. And... The the deep roots of that, I think we can talk about for much longer, but they probably include the 2008 financial crisis that wrecked the credibility of our economic system, the uh, Iraq or Afghanistan fiascos, which wrecked the credibility of our foreign policy, the development of social media, which created this very polarizing environment. And I was coming into parliament really the first generation coming in when Twitter and Facebook were really beginning to dominate political Mm -hmm. language. The rise of China, which I think had been a devastating blow to the idea that the whole of the world was moving in the direction of liberal democracies. And all of this together meant that there was increasingly a sort of hankering for a more right-wing, radical, authoritarian 
revolutionary view. And it, it's strange because, of course, the one thing it wasn't was conservative. If conservative means kind of conserving the past, protecting the constitution, this was the emergence of a new generation of politicians who wanted to destroy institutions, mm -hmm. wanted to challenge the courts, challenge the constitution, rip up international agreements. Mm -hmm. They saw themselves as throwing a hand grenade at the system. And ultimately, the, the hand grenade they came up with was this extraordinary figure, Boris Johnson. And when I said to people, as we got closer and closer to this election, how can you possibly be supporting this guy? I mean, we, we know not just that his private life is a mess, that his financial affairs are a mess, but that he's an extremely poor administrator. He's very bad mm -hmm. at managing things, right? He's just been foreign secretary and he's been a disastrous foreign secretary. And we all know him, right? I mean, he's, we, we spend time with him. And the answer seemed to be that this strange, chaotic, reckless, irresponsible person deeply appealed to a whole section of the public, partly because they wanted to smash things up. Mm -hmm. People like me and my whole way of talking, my own sort of attempt at kind of reasonableness and detail, they thought was hypocrisy. And I think that's the final thing. I mean, Boris Johnson said it himself. He said, um, the trick is that the public think that all politicians are schmucks. And my advantage is that I'm the only one who will openly admit that I am a schmuck. <laughs> Gosh. There are so many moments in the book where it feels as if you are the only adult in the room. I mean, surely there are plenty, there are others, but trying to argue for reason and, and sensibility and just watching so many of your colleagues fall for charlatanism and be blinded by the, by the desire to win at all costs. I mean, there's a, there's a quite alarming scene where you, you say to someone, how can you support Boris? And they say, well, he's a winner. He's going to win. And we'd rather have him win than, than lose, which is a very cynical, jaded and dangerous way to approach politics. But very fundamental. And, and, yeah. and, you're, and, you're, and you're right. I mean, there are many, there were many other adults in the room. I mean, I, I wouldn't want someone to read the books thinking that I was sort of setting myself up as some kind of secular saint. Mm. There were some deeply, deeply impressive people. The problem is that they were not the people who ended up at the top. Mm -hmm. When I'm asked, um, British shows, well, who do you admire? And I name these people. And there's a guy called David Gork, for example, who I think is wonderful. People say, well, I never heard of them. Because the people that they've heard of are the kind of shock jocks, the kind of people who were very, very good at making outrageous statements in the media and generating headlines around it. And the diligent, thoughtful people who I saw around the cabinet table doing a good job simply didn't get the recognition. You just mentioned David Gawke, and, and you refer to him in the book as someone who you think would have made a good prime minister because he was, quote, Tough, skillfully adept at unpopular decisions, practical and moral, modest and natural, a good listener, and an astute and elegant observer of politics, generous, provocative, and witty. I have to say that I feel that could also be a description that applies to you a little bit, Rory. Do you think you would have made a good prime minister? I don't know. I think it's a job that you is so different from anything anyone's done before. Becoming president or prime minister, I think, is, is, is a step up beyond imagining. And I think world history suggests that politicians stepping into those roles are suddenly astonished. I hope I would have been good at it, but my goodness, I would have had to develop some pretty amazing rhinoceros thick hide. The resilience that you need to do that job and keep sane and calm and energetic I mean, I'm always struck with American politicians, how they seem to go white almost immediately. And President Obama, sort of, it was yes. as though he'd had some sort of incredible shock. Presumably, it's just the responsibility and the hours. And, mm -hmm. and I, so, yes, I would have loved to be prime minister. I would have loved to try to guide us through that Brexit moment and avoid the sort of hard Brexits and the problems in Northern Ireland and the problems with our economy. But I think I shouldn't be kidding myself about how unbelievably unpleasant and tough that probably would have been. I want to quote from the book one more time, if you'll indulge me. You write, 
My failure is to beat Boris Johnson in the leadership contest and to prevent him as prime minister from leading a hard Brexit and the rightward lurch of the Conservative Party were the most painful of my life. After losing the leadership race, I spent 11 days in a silent retreat, during which my chagrin at Johnson seemed to translate into an intense pain in my left knee. (laughs) How is your left knee feeling these days? (laughs) <laughs> I actually fell in a hole in Rwanda about a year ago when I was working with Give Directly, so I injured my right knee now, which is... Uh, um, no, I, I hope I've I've left the the um, obsession with Boris Johnson slightly behind, but he still haunts me. And I'm afraid, mm-hmm. you know, it's a very sad thing. I mean, I, I have American colleagues who are sort of haunted by Donald Trump too. I mean, these figures Absolutely. do take on an incredible sort of psychic power in a very disturbing way, not just in your left knee. This is such a loaded question and impossible to answer in in the time we have. But we've been talking about this rightward lurch. We've been talking about this conservative populism and the dangers of it. And it's something you stood against as a member of parliament. It's something you, you ran against when you ran for prime minister. It's something you write against in this book. What, if anything, can be done to change the course that, that we seem to be headed in? I mean, do you have any... It's a very American thing, I suppose, to ask if you have. What are your quick solutions, Rory? But <laughs> well, I, so I think the I think the solutions are to embrace the idea, really embrace that the moral, the intellectual power of the center ground, not be driven into polarization. I think the temptation faced with a Trump or a Boris Johnson is to just say, "Screw him, screw his supporters. They're the enemy. Mm-hmm. We're going to take him out." But in the nature of a democracy is respect for fellow citizens, is the idea of a compromise, is the idea of trying to see the best in each other. That's why we mm-hmm. give everybody the vote, right? Not despising half your fellow citizens. And I think the way in which we get there is firstly acknowledging what a mess we made of the 90s and 2000s. There's a risk that politics can become a sort of tribute act to Bill Clinton, as though there was a sort of perfect era when everything was fine. It wasn't a perfect era. And the 2008 financial crisis showed that median incomes have not kept up. There's huge inequalities within our countries. And we need serious policies to deal with that, which are not silly ideas from the center, but which are genuinely devolved down to local areas to try to come up with a package that works for Michigan, a package that works for Mississippi. Now, I feel the other thing that's missing is rediscovering the confidence of morality. In the end, you need an ethical program. You can't Mm. defeat populism just by producing clever policy ideas, which you've borrowed from Sweden. You need to have a real sense of why these people are bad, why they're morally bad, why the route that they're taking you on is a deeply destructive, pessimistic vision of human nature. And I think you might add to that, we could do with a bit of sense of humor in the center. I mean, one of the problems Mm. is that those of us who are liberals tend to be a bit humorless and a bit hectoring. Mm. And it's no surprise that often these populist leaders are actually close to being professional comedians or their television personalities, leaving everybody else feeling very, very kind of wooden. So I think if we could put those three things together, which is acknowledging our faults with an economic policy that can actually transform left behind areas, a sense of moral purpose and a bit of humor, there is a chance. I don't think populism's rise and victory is inevitable. After the break, we'll talk about the nonprofit Rory helps lead, Give Directly, which has put more than half a billion dollars in cash straight into the hands of people living in poverty including right here in the U.S. Plus, Rory shares the surprising strategy he thinks President Biden should use in the upcoming election. Stay with us. Season's greetings, everyone. I'm Anya Shishnevsky, assistant editor here at the Next Big Idea Club. Nothing says the holidays to me quite like a cozy fireplace, snow drifting past the windows, and a good book in my hands. Even if you don't live in a region with snowy winters, 
I'd bet you agree that the winter months are a great time to slow down and reflect on your habits, relationships, and opinions. Our curated selection of nonfiction titles here at the Next Big Idea Club are meant to spark that inner flame of curiosity, motivate you towards your goals, and expand your mind. Our membership packs a perfect tool belt for the lifelong learner. You'll get daily book bite summaries, written and read by the authors themselves, weekly author interviews, quarterly Q&As, and so much more. There's something here for everyone, including me. There have been times when I felt immobilized by heartache, but with the help of new releases about cultivating joy, voices at the Next Big Idea Club lit the pathway back to inner peace. At other times, I have felt on top of the world, and our content helped me channel that energy to its fullest potential. The best part is it comes from an amazing cast of authors. Level up this season with an NBIC membership for yourself or your loved ones. Take $75 off your order when you use the code GIFT75 at nextbigideaclub.com. That's GIFT75 at nextbigideaclub.com for $75 off. You're out of politics now. You're out of the conservative party. But you're still very busy. You sort of end the book with this with this suggestion that you're just sort of hanging around planting trees, but you host a chart-topping podcast, like I believe the most popular podcast in the UK called The Rest is Politics with Alistair Campbell. And you're now the senior advisor to a really remarkable organization called Give Directly. Tell us what what that organization does. Well, Give Directly is an extraordinary uh, nonprofit set up by a group of young Americans who were graduate students at Harvard and MIT, who about 12 years ago began to see incredible evidence that giving unconditional cash to the extreme poor had more impact on their lives than any other traditional program, and set off to Kenya, where they put their own money into a very small program to try to prove this on the ground. And it became the fastest growing NGO in the world. Wow. And it now works in 15 different countries. And we are absolutely pushing <laughs> the model of unconditional cash transfer. And, and why? Well, because it turns out that traditional development programs are incredibly complicated and incredibly wasteful, largely because we're trying to do things for other people that they would be able to do much more efficiently for themselves. So I'll give you a sort of quick example. If you went to a nonprofit and said, here's a village on the Rwanda-Burundi border with people living mm -hmm. on less than $2 a day, and we want to get 80% of people on electricity, we want 100% of people to have latrines, we want every roof in the village to be fixed, we want to drive up the number of kids in school, we want to improve nutrition, we want to improve health outcomes, we want to drive up savings and incomes, we want to increase the number of small businesses. A traditional nonprofit would then design a multi-million dollar program where they would go around measuring houses, procuring sheet metal for roofs, running youth business training programs, nutrition programs, school enrollment programs, and the rest. Give Directly instead will take $70,000, divide it amongst the 100 households, so we get $700 unconditional cash each, and let them get on with it. And within three months, you find that 80% of people have electricity, 100% have got a roof, 100% have managed to get a latrine going, the number of businesses has spiked, almost everybody's in school, bone density and stunting's improved, health outcomes have improved, because they've done it themselves. And, and they've done it themselves in a way that recognizes that every house is different. I might mm -hmm. actually already have a roof. My priority might be getting my kid in school. You might want to open a tailoring shop. And at the bottom of it is the fact that we've been telling ourselves for 70 years that the secret of international development is that if you give someone a fish, they eat for a day. But if you teach them to fish, they eat for a lifetime. What Give Directly has worked out is that in fact, going around the world teaching people to fish is a very, very expensive, wasteful thing to do. 
Mm -hmm. Because many people around the world, particularly in extreme poverty, already know how to fish, but just don't have the money for a fishing hook. Well, they don't want to fish. They want to open a bakery. And it speaks to how paternalistic so much of traditional aid has been. NGOs flying in and assuming they know best. You know, I, I think it's it's also worth pointing out that you're active all over the world. You're active in the United States. I mean, you, you have a program where you're you're giving every pregnant mother in Flint, Michigan, seven thousand dollars. So, so talk a little bit more about 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 the yeah. work you're doing here in the U.S. Because yeah. I think it's easy to sort of say, oh, well, yeah, that would work in a, in a place you know in a lower middle income country where you know cost of living is significantly lower. Blah blah blah. But no, it's working in the U.S. and not with you're not giving people you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. You're, you're still there's these are still smaller sums, but really meaningful. Yes, I think that's right. So the majority of our work is, of course, in sub-Saharan Africa, where you're working with people who are on less than $2 a day and who, you know, are starting from a very, very low base. But we are also increasingly working in the US and finding some very remarkable impacts. So we're doing, as you say, work with uh, mothers in Flint, Michigan. We've done work in Cook County and in Chicago. We've done work with African-American communities in Georgia. And in every case, we are finding just the immense flexibility and power of cash. It's also true that in Canada, there's been some incredible work on giving cash to the homeless, which you would have thought was a sort of categorically disastrous thing to do. Hmm. And there, the result has been unbelievable. You give a large amount of unconditional cash to a homeless person and rather than, as you might fear, people spending it on drugs and you know ending up on the streets, they actually very, very rapidly, most people end up in a much better situation. They end up housed and they end up saving the government money. So I think there's a lot of application to this in our own societies. Mm -hmm. And this is part of something we began with, which is I think our societies are still very patronizing. They're very centralized. Mm -hmm. We're not fully embracing what it means to be equal citizens that we are genuinely equal and that finding ways of, I, I hate words like empowering because it's a sort of jargon word, but, but giving people the chance to, the freedom to make their own choices, to be dignified, understanding that they know more, care more, and can do much more for their own conditions than some distant person. Mm -hmm. And we now have such good evidence there are over 300 academic papers doing randomized control trials. So this is literally like a medical trial where you're taking a control group and a treatment group. You're giving cash to one group. You're giving no cash to the other group. You're studying over three, six, nine, 12 years what the impact is. And these studies are demonstrating again and again the evidence that cash is more powerful than almost any other intervention. But despite all the evidence, all the papers, my goodness, people struggle. Mm -hmm. If I would say to anybody who was making this to me, well, you know, what would happen if I were to give you the cash? You know, would you would you waste it? And generally people are like, no, no. I mean, obviously, you know, if I was really poor and I got that chance, you know, I'd, I'd put it into stuff that was really meaningful. But it, it's the sort of idea that somehow other people wouldn't do this. And of course, actually, the extreme poor are more responsible in the way they use the cash mm -hmm. generally than wealthier people because... They have been so trapped for so long. They've spent 20, 30 years thinking, what would I do if I just had a bit of cash? They're much less likely to waste it than almost anybody else. And so trapped, again, you know, in the U.S. context, so trapped by a system that is just absurdly bureaucratic and difficult to navigate, so trapped by hours upon hours upon hours of dealing with forms and vouchers and just insane. Well, it's com completely mad. And which is why probably the most exciting thing that came out of Joe Biden's administration was the child tax credits, which yes. was brought in by Congressman Rosa DeLauro, where, you know, that was incredibly generous, over $3,000 per child. And a real attempt to minimize the paperwork. So if you weren't registered, you could get the money anyway made such a difference to child poverty in the US and has now been blocked and discontinued. I mean, if you were looking for a single thing for President Biden to run on against Trump, I would be running on that and I would be absolutely leaning into the commitment on that. All right. Well, that's the Rory Stewart, uh, that's the Rory Stewart advice for 2024. 
Um, well, I would I would encourage all listeners, to, and we'll put a link to this in the episode notes, to go to the Give Directly website, and and you can read all of this research. You can learn about different programs that Give Directly runs around the world. It, it's it's truly eye opening, remarkable. I sound very Californian with using all those excited words to describe it. Um, but I have I have one last question for you, Rory, which is, you know, we began by talking about ambition and your your youthful ambition to make a dent in the world. And it strikes me that you've done that on two tracks. One is as a politician. The other track has been writing, speaking, now podcasting, working with NGOs. And I wonder when historians many years from now look back on the life and times of Rory Stewart, do, do you think they'll think it was admirable that he went into politics, but his the real mark that he left was as a writer, as a speaker, as a director of nonprofits, as a, I mean, as a podcaster. Will historians know what podcasting is? We'll have to see. <laughs> I, I I don't know. Everybody has a different view on what makes for a valuable life. But for me, looking back at all the different things I've done, the thing that moves me most is working with a team that I love. Really what made that work in Afghanistan so special was these extraordinary Afghan and foreign colleagues that I had and the sense of being able to do something together to achieve something with people that I who I thought were funny, brave, dignified, just people I was really proud to be with. And I think if I'm looking, I'm I'm 50 now for the what I'm doing with my life. I hope I have the kind of courage and the sense to hold on to that insight, and not get tempted back into these kind of grand sounding big abstract public jobs, but continue to commit to the small, the concrete, the tangible, the particular, where I really felt the real joy and satisfaction of life exists. Hmm. Well, let's leave it there. Rory, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for the work you do with Give Directly, and thank you for this book, How Not to Be a Politician. You know, reading it as an American who has a very limited understanding of sadly, of, of UK politics. It still is a searing indictment, a powerful book. It's like watching an Aaron Sorkin character wander into House of Cards. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. And thank you so much for your, your kind words about the book and, and for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Rory Stewart's new book, How Not to Be a Politician, is out now. And if you'd like to learn more about Give Directly, visit Give Directly. Dot org. There's a link in the episode notes. Today's show was written and edited by me, Caleb Bissinger. Mike Toda did the sound design. Special thanks to John Miller, who gave me invaluable advice on how to put this episode together, and to Yona, Charlotte, and Tyler for making it happen. Our executive producer is Rufus Griscom, and we could not make this show without the support of the LinkedIn Podcast Network. By the way, one last thing I learned about Rory Stewart. He signs all of his letters, very best wishes. So, dear listener, very best wishes for a happy, healthy, prosperous new year.